And now, for a topic no DBA wants to admit he knows, replication. Welcome to this video on SQL Server on Linux. My name is Kevin Fiesel. I'm the proprietor of Catalyxy Services LLC, a consulting firm which specializes in work all across the data platform space, especially SQL Server. We have gone over quite a bit in this series on SQL Server on Linux, and it's about time to wrap the series up. And what better way to drive off potential viewers than to talk about replication? So come join me in the classroom as we talk about this topic. Replication is another SQL Server technology intended to keep two databases in sync. Unlike failover cluster instances, we don't need shared hardware for replication to work. Unlike availability groups, we don't need to replicate an entire database. We can choose which tables, views, stored procedures we want to replicate. And also unlike availability groups, we can even modify data on the replicated subscribers. This is the joy of replication. But with the joy of replication comes the pain of replication, the dark side of this feature. You see, there's a reason DBAs start ducking and breaking eye contact when you mention replication problems, and it's not just because we're socially awkward. The reason for this is, there's a lot happening under the covers where you only have a limited amount of information available to you if things go wrong. And it's clear, as we'll go through these, that Microsoft has certain types of replication that are more equal than others. Because I'm on the topic, let's quickly cover those types of replication available to SQL Server. First up, we have snapshot replication. This one is pretty easy to understand. Give me all of the rows from the publisher's table on my subscriber table. If a new row gets added to the publisher, we will not see it on the subscriber until we rerun the snapshot replication SQL agent job. Snapshot replication is great for small databases that don't change very often and pretty okay for a poor man's readable secondary. The idea here would be that once a day or so, we would take a copy of the tables we need and make them available on a secondary server for access. When it comes time to rerun the job, the replication agent will truncate data in that subscriber table and move the data over again. Second is the golden child in the replication world, transactional replication. Transactional replication has by far the most support in SQL Server, and there's a pretty good amount of information out there on how it works and how you can troubleshoot issues. Granted, transactional replication still falls into the replication is bad, pretend I've never heard of the term replication before, because, well, DBAs don't necessarily know where all of the diagnostic information gets stored or how you can use it to get a feeling for how far behind you are and when you'll catch up. But that's not a video for today. Anyhow, the idea behind transactional replication is that I'm still making changes to the data on my publisher and I want my subscribers to get those data changes as soon as possible. What's interesting is that my subscribers don't need to be read-only like with an availability group. I can write data to subscribers and the publisher won't get that data. Now, we can run into all sorts of unfortunate issues doing this, so it's not a pattern I would typically advise you follow. There is also this idea of bi-directional transactional replication, and that's all I'm going to say about it right now. Third, we have merge replication. This is the most maligned form of replication out there for a couple of reasons. One reason is that it's a lot harder to diagnose issues than transactional replication. Another reason is there are more moving pieces and so more things that can break. The third reason is there's less information available to us about it, not only in terms of documentation, but also in terms of the diagnostic data in the database. I've worked with merge replication a lot over the years, unfortunately, and I can appreciate its positive qualities, but Look, I still work myself up into an angry fervor whenever I have to troubleshoot a problem with it. But, uh, but I will say, merge replication does have something quite useful going for it. It allows us to write to subscribers and to publishers, 
and it makes sure that the data gets moved between publishers and subscribers automatically. This means we get some limited form of scale out technology with SQL Server. It's not true scale out because there still has to be a central publisher that acts as the clearinghouse for all of this data. But I've seen it work quite well in areas where you have essentially independent geographically distributed servers and want to roll up all of their data into a central analytical server. Finally, we have peer-to-peer -peer replication. I've personally never used peer-to-peer -peer replication in SQL Server, so I'll just make mention that it exists, but also it's really uncommon to see this in the wild, as it's even more of a challenge to deal with than merge replication. Of these, I'm going to state up front, SQL Server on Linux only supports snapshot and transactional replication. It does not support merge or peer-to-peer -peer replication, so as a result, I'm not going to say anything more about the two in this video. I've also made mention of a couple of terms we use in replication, and those are the available roles. Now there are three roles in replication. The first role is the publisher. The publisher is the SQL Server instance that ultimately owns the data. End users and applications connect to this instance to write data, and our replication topology, that is the set of servers involved in replication, it drives everything from the publisher. At the other end of the spectrum is subscribers. Subscribers receive data from the publisher, making it available to people who connect directly to the subscriber instance. Subscribers will not be able to send data back to the publisher, at least not with the forms of replication we have available on Linux. But unlike availability groups, these are still writable tables. Also, we can filter down and choose which objects we want to replicate on a database. We can choose to send only specific data from tables or specific objects like views and stored procedures to the subscribers. Finally, we have the middleman, the distributor. The job of the distributor is to make sure that the data from the publisher gets to the subscriber. Usually, the publisher server also takes on the role of distributor because it is the easiest solution and distributors usually don't add too much stress to a SQL Server instance. But in cases where we have an enormous amount of data to process, or if our publisher is under constant stress, or if we have so many replication tasks that we've actually blown past the SQL agent job limit, which by the way, you can do, well, we could enlist a totally different SQL Server instance to act as the distributor in those cases. That's the high level on what you need to know about replication. Now let's get into gear and set this thing up. In the prior video, I used three SQL Server on Linux virtual machines to build out some availability groups. Let's use those same three instances and see what kind of shenanigans we can get up to with replication. As a quick reminder, these instances are called SQL AG0, SQL AG1, and SQL AG2. SQL AG0 was the hero of the prior video, so I think it's time we let someone else step up, and that is going to be SQL AG2. I'll have that instance act as the publisher. On that instance, we have a database called BLS, containing data I gathered from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Opening up the database, there are two tables in the DBO schema, DBO.CPI base and DBO.CPI data. I'd like to replicate these to SQL AG1. Here's what we're going to do. The first thing we need to do is make sure the SQL Server agent is enabled. I can do that with MS SQL Conf, like so. And we also need to restart the SQL Server service, so I went ahead and did that while we were waiting. Now I need to do the same thing on SQL AG1. Well, that was easy. Next up, I need to create a directory to store replication data and make sure that the MS SQL user owns that folder. I'll create it under the default SQL Server data directory. I'll first create it on SQL AG1, considering that I'm still here. And now let's bring it back to SQL AG2 and get the directory created there as well. Great. The next step is going to involve some T-SQL. This is a multi-part script, but let's take it one piece at a time. Lines three through five cover what we need for setup. We're going to run this on the distributor server. 
That said, in this case, the distributor is the same server as the publisher. I'm doing this for the sake of simplicity, but I could also host it on a different server if absolutely necessary. I'll need some login and password that has access to this instance, so I'm going to use the username REPL admin and a suitably good password. Of course, that login has to exist, so let's create it. I'll open a new query window and create the login and user. For this, I'm going to give REPL admin sysadmin permissions. I don't typically like giving out sysadmin, but for replication, I generally make an exception simply due to how many separate permissions we usually need for the distributor's login. Now let's switch back to the big script. On line seven, we'll mark SQL AG2 as a distributor. Then lines nine through 15, create the distributor database for us. Let's give this first section a run. This takes some time to run, but it will eventually create a distribution database. If I drill into the system databases node once everything has finished, I can even see it there. Okay, let's scroll down and go to the next section. On line 20, we specify the location of the snapshot directory. Then we create a UI properties table if it does not exist, and we set an extended property on UI properties to specify that, hey, this is where our snapshot directory is. That's gonna be it for the distributor. Now let's talk about the publisher. Our publisher is our distributor, it's SQL AG2. We're also going to use the distributor login and password from the prior section and add a distribution publisher. We need to set the login and password for it, set our working directory, and note that this is a SQL Server Publisher, a setting that means more on SQL Server for Windows, where we can have replication against Oracle databases. But it's not possible for SQL Server on Linux, so let's ignore that bit. I'm going to run this script and let it go to completion. Now I need to create a job for publication. Just as before, I'm going to paste in a script and we'll take it one piece at a time. We're going to do this in the BLS database, and I'll set the replication database name, as well as the login and password for my REPL admin login. On lines seven through nine, I'm specifying that I want to publish the BLS database. Then lines 11 through 21 cover the creation of the publication itself. I'll call that publication BLS underscore CPI, and it will be a transactional publication. The sync method is concurrent, which is only available to transactional publications, and it prevents locking the table during snapshot creation. On line 14, retention tells us how many hours we are willing to wait for a subscription to be active. If it's not active over that time period, we will automatically remove it. When I set retention to zero like I have it, this means we never automatically remove old subscribers, and we would need to remove them manually. I do recommend keeping this at zero because the worst thing that can happen is a subscriber that fails while you're on vacation and you come back to a mess when the subscriber's gone without a trace and you're not even sure what it was subscribed to. Lines 15 and 16 say that we want to allow both push and pull replication for this publication. Push replication is where the publisher feeds changes down to the subscribers. Poll replication, meanwhile, is where the subscribers ask for changes and the publisher responds with the relevant change sets. On line 18, we set the replication frequency to continuous. For transactional replication, we want to do this rather than the alternative, which is to have the publisher run on a schedule. The final thing I want to touch on here is line 21, which indicates that any data definition language changes I make to articles that are part of this publication also make their way to subscribers. In other words, I have a table called CPI base, and if I add a new column on the publisher side, that change will automatically get promulgated down to the subscribers. DDL changes on the subscribers will not make their way back to the publisher, however. On lines 23 through 36, I set up the publication snapshot. There's not much to mention here, save that in lines 35 and 36, these are where we set the login and password that we'll use for replication on the publisher. 
I'm going to run this whole batch from line 1 through line 36. Now that that's done, I can begin adding articles. An article, by the way, is a fancy word for table, view, stored procedure, function, or other asset that is part of replication. I'm going to add two articles here, one for the CPI base table and one for the CPI data table. Lines 38 through 53 add one article called CPI base. This is a table in the DBO schema. Its type on line 42 is log based, which is the default and indicates that this is a table. There's not too much else here that's exciting, though I suppose I should mention that lines 51 through 53, which are the stored procedures that the replication service will call to insert, delete, and update data on the subscriber. These get created automatically by the process when we create a subscription. I'm going to try to run this, but I am going to get an error because transactional replication requires that every table involved has a primary key. That way, the replication service can know which row or rows change and manage them on the subscriber. I'm going to open a new window and create a pair of primary keys, because it turns out I didn't have a primary key on either table. Let's run this script, and we'll create those primary key constraints. Now that that's done, I can return to the prior tab and run the sp add article command again. This time, I successfully created the article. I'm going to do the same thing with the next article, dbo.cpi data. With that in place, our publication is out there and ready to go. In fact, let's switch over to SQL Server Management Studio and check it out. Here in SSMS, I am already connected to SQL AG2. If I drill into the replication folder, I can then choose local publications. That will list out my one publication, bls underscore cpi. If I right-click on it, I can navigate to Properties. In the Properties window, I'm going to select the Articles page. Once that loads, which may take a few moments depending on your server, but we can see the two relevant articles, just as we expected. I'm going to cancel out of this and go back to Azure Data Studio. As I mentioned before, I can create either push or pull subscriptions. Let's create a push subscription, which means we're going to push data from SQL AG2 to SQL AG1. Before I can do that, however, I'm going to need to create a login on SQL AG1. I'll use the same REPL admin login and password, though it doesn't need to be the same in practice. I'm just being lazy. I'll also create an empty database called BLS so that we have a shell to write into. Now, back on the publisher, I've got one more script to run. Lines three through six in this script set up the variables I'm going to use. Then, lines eight through 15 add the subscription to the BLS CPI publication. It's a push subscription that syncs automatically rather than manually, and we're going to sync all of the articles. Lines 17 through 32 create the SQL agent job that we'll use to keep the databases in sync. This is where we use the subscriber login and password to make any DDL or DML changes on the replicated database. Let's give this a run, and it should create the subscription within a few seconds. Once it does, we'll be in good shape. How good of shape? Well. Let's open a new query window against SQL AG1. I'm going to try running a simple query. Execute that and... Well, it looks like there's no table there yet. So let's switch over to SSMS for a moment. Here in SSMS, if I drill into the SQL agent jobs for SQL AG2, I can see three agent jobs that all start with the name SQL AG2. The first job is a transaction log reader agent, and it runs on the publisher. The second is the snapshot agent for the publisher, and the third is the subscriber agent job. I'm going to run this second job now. It's going to take a few moments and it will complete as the two tables are not very large. What it's doing is it's taking a snapshot of all of the articles so that this information can be sent over to my subscribers. Once it does complete, I'll be able to return back to Azure Data Studio. So let's do that. 
Now I'll run the query again. This time around, we get success, like we might have expected the first time. 10 rows come back, and that's a good thing. Let's try making some changes. I'll open a new query window for SQL AG2 in the VLS database. In this window, I'll modify a row. First, let's check out the CPI base table where base underscore ID is one. Now that we know what it looks like, I'll update CPI base and set the base type name to something else for that ID. We'll run the query again and make sure the change committed locally. Now let's switch back over to SQL AG1 and I'll run the same select query. It looks like our change made it over. That tells me replication did what I expected of it and that's all I can ask. And that was the nickel tour of replication for SQL Server on Linux. I know we didn't go too far into detail on replication, but I also know that many DBAs will have averted their eyes simply by seeing the title of this video. That said, if you are interested in me digging further into the topic of replication, let me know and I might create a series on it if there are enough offers of tribute. Otherwise, that's going to do it for this series on SQL Server on Linux. I might get back to the series later, but as of right now, there are no plans for additional videos on this topic in the works. If you do have some SQL Server on Linux topic you'd like me to drill into, whether because I didn't talk about the topic at all or because you'd like a deeper dive into it, let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to address it. In the next video, we're going to kick off a brand new series, so stay tuned for that. We'll have links and show notes in the description below, and until we see each other in the next video, take care.